Uh, so I love that. I do want to get uh, Susie wrote in a question, which I think, you know, we, we cycle on all the time. Uh, what are some questions to ask when looking for a good ABA provider? Thank you, Susie. Oh, yeah, I think that's a, a perfect great question. question. Susie. It is. It, that's probably, that's like an area that Shannon and I are both pretty passionate about. So I'm, yeah. I'm really glad that you asked. And I'll throw some out and Shannon, please throw some out as well. Um, I guess I would start with finding out about the credentials of the people providing the services. So, you know, it's, I'm not big into, I don't care about licenses or degrees, but having a BCBA or board certified behavior analyst, um, kind of gives you some level of assurance that the ABA that is taking place is at least of a higher quality. Um, and those are the individuals who are the supervisors are usually BCBAs. And, and in terms of therapists or individuals who are actually doing the direct work, you should maybe ask and say, how many of your therapists are RBTs, registered behavior technicians, or BCATs, board certified autism technicians? It's kind of important to make sure that these credentials are somewhere there only because you have to go through a ton of training to get these credentials. If someone doesn't have the credential, it doesn't mean they're not good. In fact, some of my favorite therapists don't hold these credentials, but they have 10 years of experience. So that's kind of the other side of it is how much experience do your, tra do your therapists have? And if you're hiring therapists, how much training do you give them? That's a really, really important question. Take a look at the training that's given to the individuals. And it cannot be all class time because we learn the best when we're actually doing hands-on practical work, right? So those are some questions, the credentials, the training. And then I think um, I would ask how much parent training and education is provided? Because I think as parents, the more we learn about ABA and what's going on with our child and autism and the treatment program and all of that, the more involved we are, the more we know the, the data that is being collected is actually good and accurate. And um, we, we just give it a different level of quality if we're involved as parents. So I would find out what parent training they provide. And then I think for me, it's really, really important. Like I, there are some incredible behavior analysts out there. In fact, I'm just about to interact with one of them because I'm trying to help someone open a series of clinics in Saudi Arabia. And there are some providers of ABA who are fabulous at ABA, but they absolutely do not give any credence to anything else. And I, I pull back from that a little bit. I have I have a hard time with that because, you know, obviously I'm a behaviorist. I'm a doctoral level behavior analyst, but I have and I'm a psychologist, but I have always known that we're not this is not a learned disorder. And yes, we're changing behavior, but it's a human being. It's a, and this human being has medical needs, dietary needs, sleep-related issues, immune-related issues, pain, gastrointestinal issues. And so for me, those providers of ABA who are open-minded about what else is out there, and they are open-minded about learning and saying, oh, okay, so, well, this child has a lot of dietary issues. I'm going to respect the diet that the child is on. I am going to make sure that we don't mess up this diet. I'm going to make sure the child is also able to receive his occupational therapy because he has sensory needs. I'm going to make sure that I communicate with the physicians involved because this child has seizure disorder or whatever it might be. I think ABA providers who have a multidisciplinary approach are, in my mind, going to be more successful because they just, you know, they take care of the whole organism, the whole person, rather than looking at it as just a, a black box with behaviors. So to me, those are some of the more important things. Shannon, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I think um, there's so many things, right? 
Um, but I think one of the things that you have to ask out the gate is how much availability do you have for, for therapists? If I prioritize mm -hmm. ABA and say that I'm going to get my child to be with your therapist for the number of hours that the prescription is written, can you fill that prescription? Um, or, or are you only able to do half of it? I think you need to know going in and I'll tell you what else, why I think that that's a good question to ask, because I think you need to set the tone with your ABA provider and let them know you're taking it seriously. Yeah. Because, because that would be my first question. And then my second question right. would be as much as we're going to prioritize ABA, we want to know that you're working in a multidisciplinary um, way. But I think if you, my fear is that if you start with the multidisciplinary question, um, that they'll be afraid. Cause we, we see a lot of families. I I'm sure, you know, Dr. Grand Pichet, that they're like, well, we'll do ABA, but we'd like to do eight hours of ABA and we're going to do 10 hours of equine yeah. therapy and we're going to do speech and OT, but we only have time for 10 hours of ABA. Yeah. Whereas, I mean, if I, you yeah. know, if I could give you anything, I would say to you, depending on, let's say your child has a prescription for 30 hours of ABA, I would tell you to go do the 30 hours of ABA and then go do the 10 hours of equine therapy. Make sure that you do the speech and the OT and you do all of them. Yep. Um, and you'll be on a treadmill, but in a couple of years, you'd be like, "Woo! wasn't, wasn't that amazing? Look where we are now. Oh yeah. But, but I think it, I think a lot of ABA providers have gotten used to parents who are not committed. So I would lay that groundwork first and tell them you're committed. Are they, are they going to take it as seriously as you are? Cause I think that sets a tone. Yeah. But then, but then I don't know how to ask this question, Dr. Grant Pichet, but one of the things that I walked away with a couple of weeks ago um, and I want to know from you, how do you ask, I want to know, how do we find out that they're going to look at it and with your eyes and say, is it fair? Because I see a lot of ABA providers yeah. who don't yeah. understand that. So yeah. what's the question that would get to that to see if they, if they understand that concept? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, so here's the problem I'm coming, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll put on my, ABA hats for a minute, right? Okay. And I'll say. And by the way, Gina has written in and said, "Good morning. What is ABA?" Ooh, I, I love that. applied behavior analysis, Gina. And I will, after I finish this question, I'll probably talk about that for the next fifteen minutes or so. So just stick with me, Gina. <laughs> yeah, stick with us. But um, so, as a provider, I want the parents to know that. The minute you start asking a lot of questions, a lot of the providers become defensive yeah. and they are in a position right now where there's like a huge need, right? I mean, there's wait lists everywhere. And so it, it's a little problematic to make them defensive because they're kind of, uh, providers are in a very arrogant space right now. And they're kind mm -hmm. of like, it's gotta be my way. And you know, you gotta just deal with it and that's that. And so it's very, very hard. And what Shannon also said is very true is like a lot of these providers don't even have time. So they will take you on as a patient and then they're supposed to provide you 20 hours and they provide you 10. That's a problem too. But there, I don't know that there's a question that will help determine if the person, if the provider is looking at things in a fair way. And what we mean by that is this, you never want your child to go through an intervention that doesn't make sense to you. So they, the tr provider will have, must have taught it to you and explained it to you first. That's really important. I would never do anything with any of my kids if the parents didn't understand exactly what I'm trying to accomplish. Because Sometimes the kids will go through, and some of you will know this, they'll go through hours of crying and your ABA therapist will say, or BCBA will say, let them cry. It's okay. But as a parent, none of us are willing to let them cry unless we know why we're doing that. Unless we know that we're letting them cry because if we don't, then they're learning to cry as a form of communication. And they, they, we, it's important that we understand all of this. And then we as parents, like when I observe Shannon is when I really learn whether someone is treating a child fairly, because the amount of, I guess, stress, ABA is all about teaching a lot of stuff, right? I want to 
teach you not just to challenging behaviors are not okay, but I want to teach you all the right language, all the right social, all the right adaptive, all the stuff you need to become your own age level. So I'm going to give you intensive tutoring. So there's a lot of demands. There's a lot of pressure. So at the same time, there's got to be tons of reinforcers. That's how you make it fair. If you are pushing a child, you need to make sure they're feeling really rewarded as well. And then the child will let you know if it's fair because the children who are getting good ABA are generally happy. They're not going through a rough time forever. Maybe the first six months when they're adjusting is a little tough, but they're generally actually looking forward to it because that's where they learn and that's with how they benefit. So Shannon's right. It's very important to make sure you have a fair program so your child is not continuously unhappy. They have moments of stress, but they also have moments where they feel very accomplished and feel good about themselves. And are having good. fun. And they're having a great time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, Shannon, along with that, you made me think that a good ABA program has a lot of meetings with the team. That is important for supervisors to change the program continuously. Like when I work with a child and if the child is having a really hard time and it's already two weeks of that, I'm going to change the program. I'm not going to blame the child. I'm going to say there's something wrong with the way we're teaching. We either have to increase the reward, we have to make it easier. And we have to make sure this child is looking at the model and learning. So modify, modifying your program constantly is a really key feature of a good ABA program. Actually, Shannon, didn't we write about this? We did, and I just haven't published it yet, but it's coming. I'm gonna, I, I, I know, I keep saying that, but it's April is coming. I, know, I, I gotta get it published it. in April. <laughs> yeah, great. I, I, you should, everybody should fire me. Everybody mm -hmm. should write in and fire me if I don't get it published in April. It's just like heinous and there's no excuse. So I'm not making any. Um, anyway. Uh, but so maybe we can tell Gina because Gina's like, okay, you just talked about this, but I don't know what it is. And and every once in a while, we need to okay. go back to basics. What is ABA? Oh, I love that one. So it's so fun to talk about what is ABA. ABA is the, it's, it's, it says applied behavior analysis, and it is based on the area of psychology called operant conditioning. It's a part of psychology. And all it's, it's kind of a learning technique, a teaching technique, right? But it's based on operant psychology, operant conditioning, which says any behavior that is followed by a reinforcer is going to increase. And any behavior that is not followed by a reinforcer or reward is going to decrease. Now, forget about autism for a minute and just apply that to normal behavior, life, right? So you go to work. That's the behavior. And what maintains that behavior? Why does why do you continue to go to work? Because you get paid. That's your reward. You get paid. Now, sometimes get you, the amount you get paid is not enough, but your social environment at work, your friends and colleagues adds to the reward. And bottom line, the reward, the reinforcer becomes enough to keep you going to work. If you were, if suddenly you didn't get a paycheck, trust me, you wouldn't go to work. Most of us will not go to work if we don't ha get something out of it. Okay. Now, and you could be getting other rewards out of it aside from money, obviously. So look, now take that concept and how do we apply that concept to autism and the treatment of autism? We list a bunch of symptoms or behaviors that we see in the individual. For example, this child is not doesn't have enough language skills doesn't have enough social skills doesn't have enough play skills but they have too much uh tantrums they have too much aggression they they're communicating with really a lot of challenging behaviors they run away they hit they fight all that right so i want to decrease these and i want to increase these Right? I want to decrease those challenging behaviors and I want to increase those skills that are a little bit behind. So what do I do? The ones that I want to decrease, I make sure the child doesn't get rewarded when they do those behaviors. What does that mean? 
That means whenever a child tantrums, I figure out why they're tantruming. Are they tantruming because they want to try to gain access to an object, like get a toy from another child? Are they tantruming because I just told them we have to get ready and go and they don't want to go? There's always a reason. And I do the contrary to that reason. For instance, if the child wants to get access to a toy when they tantrum, I make sure they don't get access to the toy. And that teaches the child over time, hey, every time I tantrum, it's I don't get any kind of reward out of it anymore. Remember the concept? Reinforcer is not there. So that behavior goes down. As that behavior goes down, it also is super important that I teach appropriate skills, this side of the angle, right? So all of these things, the social skills, the language, the play, the adaptive, all of these things that are behind, you model them and you get the child to do them and then you reward them. And so these are increasing. So you're teaching adaptive skills at the same time, you are reducing these challenging behaviors and then you get to kind of a balance, which is what we find in your typical kids, right? When your typical kids, they also tantrum, they just don't always tantrum when they want to communicate. And we try to make it so that our children learn to use their language, their social skills, et cetera, instead of these challenging behaviors. And then that's kind of ABA. And then, of course, it gets more advanced as the child ages. And the idea with ABA is to get the child to a point where they can just learn from general education and keep going. And I just want to say, in case they didn't get it, because it was so eloquent what you were saying. So. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people miss the finer point that you you don't just say, no, I'm not going to give you the toy for the tantrum. Over on the other column, you're teaching them how to appropriately ask for and get the toy. Did everybody right. get that? Because right. that's what's key. Because when I'm the child, if I've learned that if I throw the tantrum, grandma gives me the lollipop, right? Then I'm going to throw the tantrum because I want the lollipop and that's what's required. And if I find that every time I throw the, the, the tantrum, I don't get the lollipop. But if I just nicely say, can I have a lollipop? Then grandma gives it to me. It is easier yeah. for me to ask for it than to throw the tantrum. Yeah, Once I've key. learned how. That's key. And, and that's important because you don't have to also like a lot of times I'll say that, Shannon, and then a parent will come back and say, but my child's nonverbal. It doesn't matter. Your child does not have to say, can I please have the lollipop? They can point to an icon of a lollipop. And every child can learn to do that. And that gesture, that particular touch a, a, an icon, touch a picture of a lollipop, touch the lollipop, that kind of thing is going to be easier than the effort it takes to tantrum. And it is very, very important to teach those replacement skills. Well, it's and fair. You, it, it's and it's fair. fair. It's fair. This is the thing. That's yeah. right. And if you don't, let me tell you, you'll know right away because your child will stop that the tantrum, but they'll do something else, yes. which is maybe they'll throw an object now or something like that. So it's yeah. super important to, to make it fair and positive. Yeah. Good ABA is going to give them the skills to get their needs met. Yep. I think this is what people miss out on all the time, that's um, right. but it has to be fair or that's not happening. Um, so I so, so, so appreciate that. Okay. Uh, back to our questions here. Uh, uh, NH says that they've got a four and a half year old who speaks mostly in four to seven word sentences. They can answer many interverbal questions, which woohoo, that's fantastic, including how and why, and has good, albeit still delayed vocabulary, but he still struggles to have a conversation. She goes on mm -hmm. to say, when is it reasonable? When is a reasonable expectation for when he could converse? He just wants to talk about his interests, which is fine, but I also want to have a conversation someday. She, all, They also say, oh, and he has lots of different questions uh, for us, although that only happened in the last few months. Uh, it's trouble sustaining back and forth. I'm sending you a hug. Uh, Dr. Graham Pache, go on in. So this is super exciting, um, NH. I want to tell you, like, you're at a very, very good place, and this is... I love that place. I wish I could. I was still treating kids and I would take your child because this is such a fun place to be. Okay. So I have a lot of thoughts about this. First of all, don't worry. You're in the right place. Don't panic. Um, let him 
develop his conversations around the topic that he likes right now. Because my assumption is that you haven't done a whole lot of work on theory of mind. I don't know. But a lot of these things, when you get to this advanced of a level where your child is, there's a lot of things that have to happen kind of together. And then they, they come together in a solution. And I'll give you some examples right now. So like you're working on introverbals and that's fabulous. That means he can have conversations of, of an abstract nature about things that are not physically present in front of him, except they just have to be the subject that he likes. When it's the subject that he likes, what is he doing? He's not taking anyone else's perspective. And that's a problem when it comes to social behavior, because, you know, how many kids are going to hang around and let you dominate the conversation and just talk about whatever it is you want to talk about? Kids are going to expect some level of interaction and taking turns and, and perspective taking, right? So you will need to work on him understanding other people's perspectives. There's a series of lessons that we would normally do. I got to write all, I got to publish this, Shannon, because it's just, know. you know, it's so important to talk about these things. Like, I bet you your child, if you ask your child, throw a party for me, okay, mom. I, he and then you'll say, okay, who are you going to invite? Let's draw who's going to come to this party. Everybody will be his friends. There'll be, you know, kids' toys there. He will have a very hard time seeing the world from your perspective or anyone else's. So you're going to have to start doing activities that will help the child see that different people have different desires different beliefs, different knowledge, different perspectives, different sensory perspectives even. And as your child learns that area, which is called cognition and metacognition and other, like learning about other people's perspectives, as he learns that, then this whole concept of conversing about things that are not necessarily interesting to him will start to take shape. But he's only four and a half. So the good news is this area of perspective taking begins around four and a half in typically developing kids. So do not worry because you're on the path to learn. He's on the right path. He's right where he should be. And he's, you just need to point out, keep asking him questions like, oh, look, look at that little girl and she's crying. What do you think happened? Like, and prompt him and let him start pondering those ideas. Oh, maybe she got hurt. Well, what could have happened? Did she fall off her bike? Did somebody say something mean to her? Start getting him to think how other people feel. And, and that's a very important, that's just one phase of the whole perspective taking thing is how others feel. And as you're getting him to notice a lot of that sort of stuff, now on the language side, on the conversation side, you're going to have to teach him to start expanding now. And, and it'll be the topic of his choice. Get to a point where you can, and by the way, I'm guessing he's also able to maybe visually follow some cues. I don't know if he's able to read a lot of our kids at that point are reading. If you can somehow teach him that you will say a sentence, then he has to say a sentence, then you will, then he will like, for example, you can do it as a lesson. Like we, we had several lessons that were called statement, question, statement, statement, that sort of thing. So I would say I had toast for breakfast. And then I would prompt the child to say what he had. And then I would say my breakfast was delicious. And then I would prompt the child to, to tell me how he felt. And so this, this is how you start to build interactive conversation is getting the child to understand that there are, you know, you take turns. It's like sharing, turn taking, but in language. And there's tons of lessons that can help with this sort of thing. Um, in our, the curriculum that we wrote was called Skills. I'm not sure if it's available online. Again, I heard it is. You might want to look at look it up. It's skills for Autism. If it is online, I highly recommend it because you'll be able to go in there and see a whole bunch of activities that will help your child get to conversation. Now, everything I said, 
is only conversation with you or conversation with like a therapist. This has nothing to do with conversation with other children because that comes later. That's another phase of once he has to get better. Again, this goes back to what Shannon was saying. Always do one thing at a time. He has to get better at conversing with you, taking turns with you and going on a different subject. And as he improves there, then you can introduce other kids and then one other kid. <laughs> and then you can work it with one other kid and then multiple other kids. But for now, allow him to stay on his subject as long as he starts to take turns and, and increases it. It can't always be the same thing. And by the way, the same statement. And by the way, the fact that he's asking a lot of questions is a good thing. It'll drive you crazy for a while, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I, the reason why when I was saying certain things and I was smiling so bright because I knew they were really good signs and I know it's a very exciting time for you. And when, when you're able to do interverbals and ask the, those questions, oh, it's such an exciting time. It is. I know, I know though, that when I was there, I was like, well, when are we going to get to the point when he can write a 22 page term paper? I I, it's just so hard to I be know. in the moment. But I appreciated when other people went, oh, no, you're right on schedule. So you're right on schedule. We're sending you hugs. It's going to be good. Yeah. And I just want to say real quickly, because I saw the next, uh, uh, that NH had also written that I read a lot of books to him where we talk about the characters, feelings and motives. He's good with feelings, but not as much with understanding their motives or beliefs or knowledge, which is fabulous. And you can give him choices. The best way to teach kids is give them choices. When we just ask a question, recall of a concept they're not familiar with is hard. But if you give them choices, like for instance, you can say, so do you think she did that because she wants to help or because she's mad at him? That kind of thing. If you give him choices, he'll start to put it together and fill the gaps. Wonderful. Uh, we had a question that came in last night. What's the best way to get my son uh, away from using a sippy cup? He's only two years and three months old. That's kind of young. I mean, so what I did with, you can buy some sippy cups where the top of the sippy cup is just soft plastic or it's relatively soft. And what I would do with my kids who had sensory issues, so they kind of really wanted something that, they, that was in their mouth, was I would very gradually cut the whole of the sippy cup a little bit more, a little bit more. So it got to a point where it was super wide and then I would just remove the thing and they wouldn't even know. Like, and you just make it wider, 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 wider. And that's the way to go. But I'm not sure, um, just try it and see. You, you wanna make sure that you're not doing something that's gonna cause the child to stop drinking. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes our kids Re really want their CP cups because of the sensory feeling in their mouth. So test it out. Two, two and three months is pretty young for me. I got to say, okay. um, you'll get there eventually, but do you need to do it then? Uh, somebody else wrote in and I'm, uh, by the time this was last night, but I'm sure by this morning, they've already been to the doctor, but the question is still valid. They said, hello, my three-year-old is not feeling well at all. He has a horrible runny nose, a wet cough now for two days. He just looks miserable and I haven't been able to help him. Just checked his temperature and it says 100.6. I just can't get him to swallow any type of medicine and it's making me so sad. He only drinks water and milk. So I've tried mixing medicine in there, but he notices and he won't take it. He doesn't eat applesauce or yogurt, so I can't mix it in there. He has an appointment tomorrow, which would be today at 9 a.m. I just wish I could get him to take medicine. How do you guys do it? when your kids are sick and don't like medicine. Yeah, this is tough. Did the parents say how old he is? Three. Three, yeah. Yeah, God, let's just start by saying that there's nothing worse than when our kids are that sick. Like, it's just awful. It's just awful. Yeah. And this is a little guy and he's not feeling well. 100.6, I think is what she said, is not yes. too bad. Right. But here's the issue, sometimes we, Sometimes <clears throat> it's a lot easier to teach certain things when they're not sick, which then become useful when they are sick. 
So what I'm going to suggest to you, it's up to you if you want to try it now. Um, and if he's not feeling too good right now, might not be the right time to teach. Because when we're that sick, a lot of things just, it's hard to learn, right? Who wants to work when they're sick? But here's how you do it. it you basically have to identify, and this is the whole concept of behavior and ABA, is that you have to identify powerful reinforcers. If you don't have powerful reinforcers, you just pack it up because there's no way you're going to teach. And powerful reinforcers can be a variety of things. So for instance, in, in a case where the child is sick, uh, a, a, you know, a, a reinforcer could be something cooling for his throat, like ice cream or, uh, you know, uh, frozen yogurt or a popsicle. That might be something that he wants. On the other hand, sometimes when kids have sore throats or are not feeling well, they prefer something hot like oatmeal or uh, soup or whatever it is. You have to identify kind of what is a powerful reinforcer. And I'm going mainly with foods right now because when we're sick, we don't really find too many things to be rewarding. You know, we're not oh, interested in our books or this, that, or the other thing. But essentially, then what you do is, and this is why it's important to do this when he's not sick, because the key medications for cold, for instance, are going to be things that are pretty harmless outside of the cold. In other words, let's say you have, um, you know, either ibuprofen or acetaminophen. So that's Advil or Tylenol or Motrin or Tylenol, one of those, right, that you're going to give a three-year-old in liquid form. And then the other thing is probably going to be something for a sore throat or a cough, like let's say Delsim or something like that, which is guamphis. It's not a big deal. And maybe you want to also be able to teach him to blow his nose, um, which we talked about actually last week, and I'll talk about again. And you want to teach him to take maybe saline through his nose so you can wash out his nose. If you do those three things, most kids recover from a cold over that, right? So whether you're trying it when he's sick or not, it's totally fine to actually teach him to take those medications even when he's not sick because they're not intense medications. And the way that you do this is you take, you know, usually we use droppers with our three-year-olds or later on you can give him one of those little cups. But if he's not used to it, you're going to use one of those droppers, those big ones that have a funnel on the end. And you're just going to take a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of, let's say, the Motrin. And you're going to have in front of you a spoon of ice cream. And you're going to say, do you want the ice cream? Take this first. And you get him. And it might not he might not be happy about it, but in the you just have him try it once or twice, where you give him a tiny bit of the Motrin, and then he can have a whole bowl of ice cream. And then tomorrow you're going to do a tiny bit more of the Motrin and a bowl of ice cream. And gradually over time, you will increase, and this really just depends on him. And there's going to, it's not, it's not necessarily a pleasant experience, but it is followed by a pleasant experience, which is the ice cream, right? So a lot of kids, you have to go at whatever the child's kind of tolerance level is. So you basically will give him more and more of the medication to the point, to the dosage level, up to the dosage level, followed by less and less of the ice cream. Because we don't want to have to, like, every single time give our children a bowl of ice cream, right? So you just reduce it a little bit so that it's manageable. But the bottom line, this goes back again to that whole being fair thing, yeah. is it, you can't always teach it when the child is sick. But the concept is make it fair reduce the amount of medication that you're asking them to take and increase the reward. That becomes a level of fair. Then over time, you can increase the medication and reduce the reward because they get used to it. And just in as if you think about it like life, right? We get used to doing more and more for the same amount of reward in, in life. So it's a general process, a gradual process, but it is super, super important uh, to do. The blowing nose thing, I'll be very quick, is basically you just start with a tissue 
you hold the tissue in front of the uh, child's mouth and nose and you tell them to blow. And you can model it like, like that. And you can use other things like a candle or uh, a, one of those party favorite things initially if the child doesn't know how to blow. But you get to a point where they will blow and the tissue moves, right? And then you will get to the next stage, which is you tell you hold their mouth and you tell them blow with your nose to make the tissue move. And then they'll go like that and the tissue will move. And now they know how to blow with their nose. And as they do that, stage three, is you just take the tissue closer and hold it and then tell the child to blow. And that way you'll get some stuff out. Until then... I recommend, and it's not pleasant, but it is a way of, is just using either a neti pot or saline spray just to make sure that you're washing stuff out. Because a lot of times with our kids, if we don't know how to blow, they end up just getting sinus infections, which can be problematic later on. Absolutely. Amanda's written in. Amanda's written in and said that um, suppositories for pain relief. Some kids you can That's do that, true. other kids you can't. Um, and that now they have patches that are patch MD that um, also have vitamins and other me medicines in them. I didn't know that. And that she's also seen parents put a pill in a banana or hide it in other foods. I will tell you that for us, we sort of focused on everything outside the body. We would use medicines when when we had to, but we what I did was I got a really good vaporizer that has the little oh, yeah. top in it to put um, things in. Like and eucalyptus and menthol stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I will tell you, not that I want to advertise them here. It's the only thing I've ever bought from Arbonne. They sell, uh, it's a canister of uh, menthol and things that you put in the little thing and it Man, it'll loosen up anything and anybody. It's the greatest stuff ever. And believe me, it's expensive. Um, but we also, whenever my son would get a fever, we would take um, a, the softest washcloth that we had and not cold water and not hot water, just room temperature water and, and just wipe him down. And yeah. then once, once you wipe them down, you wrap them up in a quilt and they it like breaks the fever it's kind of amazing how it works and they feel so comfortable. Like it's a little bit uh, while you're doing it. Cause they'll go, ah, cause it feels weird. But then the relief yeah. that they feel is amazing. We focus on all of the outside yeah. stuff. Um, but sometimes you have to do medicine. Sometimes it's absolutely essential. So please follow um, anything and everything that is helpful there. We're out of time. I don't know how this happens, yes. but we're out of time. And, and that makes me sad because we didn't get through everything. But I apologize to anybody whose questions we didn't get to. You can't even imagine how much we appreciate you guys. Dr. Doreen is going to be back next Tuesday. I want you guys to know that on tomorrow's show, we're talking with uh, an autism dad who's invented um, bed pods um, that help create a sensory experience in which kids feel safe and want to stay in their beds. So we're going to be wow. talking with him about that. That's so that's cool. Isn't that, they're called yeah. Z pods. And so really? I don't know a whole lot about them except that they look like they came right off of a spaceship. So the kids love them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're going to be talking with him tomorrow. And um, then on Thursday, on Thursday show, let's talk autism with Shannon and Nancy. Nancy and I, for the first time, are welcoming Aviva Paskowitz from the Ed Asner Center. She's an artist. She's the coolest thing there is and works with individuals on the spectrum to express themselves artistically. And it's nice. the work she does is amazing. So we're excited about that. And then next week, it's just full craziness because it, I, it's, it's the first week that will actually on Friday be um, in April. But so the lead up to it, Next week, on Monday, we have Dr. Jed Baker, who I've talked about before on the show that I, I think is is wonderful. Um, he wrote No More Tantrums, but he also wrote the book on treating anxiety on teenagers that I recommend to everybody. Um, he's going to be here with us live on, on Monday. Then we have Dr. Grampiche on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. And it's just, it's insane. And, and when you guys see who we're having on in April, we already have Holly Robinson Peake going to be joining us. Wow. We have Temple Grandin going to be joining us. We have Stephen Shore going to be joining us. It's going to be it's going to be off the chain, you guys. We're really really excited about it. So all of that coming up. 
make sure that you're um, subscribing to our channel so that you get notifications because it's too much. It's too much. So oh, yeah. Shannon, I don't know if you've already told the viewers that we're shortly moving back to the studio, which is very that. exciting. I posted the first picture the other day from the studio. I was so hopeful on St. Patrick's Day because, you know, the walls are going to be all green. I was so hopeful that I was going to be able to show you my new favorite green place, but um, it was still the primer. But I did post a picture on Facebook of our, our new studio, and we are expecting to move in on April 1st. It won't, we won't be doing shows there April 1st, so but exciting. later in April, it's so exciting, you guys. And it's bigger and better. And we're, we're just a Twitter about the things we're going to be able to do there, which reminds me, I said all those things. Don't forget, if you can't get enough of Ask Dr. Doreen, which is all of us, tune mm -hmm. in to Ask Dr. Doreen. You can go there right now and ask her a question. She is on TikTok. TikTok. Believe um, it or not. It really is 2022, isn't it? Dr. Doreen is on TikTok. Now I've heard everything. Um, but it's amazing um, how fun it is. I now love TikTok because I, I had never done TikTok before. But, you know, there are a lot of crazy videos and I get to see all the things that the pet dogs do. And every time I watch something like I'll get two videos in and then the next video is Dr. Doreen telling me something. And I go, look at that. TikTok knows me. They know what I like. Um, uh, the last question they want to know, are you seeing kids right now? Uh, I am, but I'm very, very sporadically in LA. So it's really, really difficult for me to see kids right now. I think I will probably start seeing kids again, just for maybe diagnosis and maybe for some evaluation or guidance, like kind of like we do on the show. Uh, maybe in uh, April, later in April, once our office is set up. So we'll keep you updated for sure. And hopefully my schedule will open up and I'll start seeing more kids. All right. That's all we have time for today. Thank you to Dr. Grampiche for everything always. And thank always you to, a pleasure. And thank you to all of you and all the amazing things that you're doing with your lives. We just really appreciate getting to spend this time with you. We'll be back tomorrow talking about those Z-Pods. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Mm -hmm. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I feel like I'm on the wrong side of the bed. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. I don't know what to do. I'm on the wrong side. Uh, there we go. Good morning, everybody. I'm Shannon Penrod. Welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen with Dr. Doreen Grampiche. And look, we have Dr. Doreen Grampiche. Uh, so thrilled that she's here with us this morning. She's going to be with us live answering your questions starting right now. I want to let all of you know we're thrilled to have all of you. The chat is open. Uh, if you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, especially, you can be writing in. People have already, I love now when we have that minute before, people start writing in their questions. And so Michelle and Missy have already mm -hmm. written in questions. It's great. We never get through all of the questions. We're sad about that, but we're we're thrilled. My husband is sneaking me some tea. If I were mean, I would force him to stick his face on the camera. Thank you. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. And uh, <laughs> don't mind us. Uh <laughs> But um, anyway, if you guys want to be writing in, you can right now. Don't forget that the show also podcasts pretty much everywhere that there are free downloads. You can, for a podcast, you can find us, whether it's on iTunes or iHeartRadio or a million other places, because Traven is so good. He's showing you on the screen there. I can't even remember all the places that we are anymore. But 
You can find us along with a backlog of uh, videos that we've been doing. Do you realize, Dr. Grant Fichet, that in one week we're celebrating 11, 11 years on the air? That's wow. Amazing. That's, that's amazing, Sean. Wow. It's absolutely amazing. I'm and so it's also amazing. It's also amazing that Dr. Grand Pichet doesn't look a day older while I have turned into uh, an you ancient. You look gorgeous. You look <laughs> I, gorgeous. The hair has gone gray <laughs> and everything else has gone out the window. But, you know, 11 years later, Dr. Grand Pichet, there is a painting aging under a bed somewhere. Hey, mm -hmm. while we're talking about her, if you guys don't know who she is, you should definitely be following her on TikTok, where she's asked Dr. Doreen on TikTok, and you should be checking out the playlist. Dr. Grand Pichet is a licensed clinical psychologist who's been working in this field for 40 some odd years, which is crazy. Yes, I said four zero odd years, more than 40 years. She is a brilliant mind. I believe the preeminent expert in autism in all time. And uh, she's been working with individuals as young as babies, up through senior citizens, along with their families, always shows compassion and empathy for the individual, which we cannot celebrate enough. Um, thank you, Dr. Crampichet, for being here. She donates this time every week to answer your questions. Uh, I do want to say that there is no expert in this field or any other field who could give individual specific advice in this format simply because she does not have eyes on the individual. So she's going to give you uh, information that as, is of a general nature, be as specific as possible when you're writing in your questions so that, and she may have questions for you. So ask your question and then stay tuned, but be excited to be here because she's brilliant and fabulous and wonderful. Have I left anything out, Dr. Grant? You're, you're always too, way, way, way too kind to me, but thank you so much, Shannon. I appreciate it very much. And good morning, everyone. And it's lovely to be here. And Shannon, I love you. You have no idea how excited I am on Tuesday mornings to do this with you because it's so much fun doing this. In fact, yesterday, if I may, for one second, I was reading a few of the questions that came in that we didn't have a chance to answer because I'm yeah. trying to answer those on TikTok. But it just broke my heart, honestly. And, and you know, my son, he's been involved with you and has done a lot of different types of creative work together with you but we should make it clear uh, involved with me in projects in projects yeah <laughs> don't don't He's have me in yes. that cradle <laughs> yeah my son is a screenwriter and and uh shannon of course as many of you know has this other unbelievable creative side and so my son my two daughter daughters as well have learned a lot from shannon but um, yesterday he was passing by and he just heard, heard me re going like, oh, oh my God. And I was just like, and I was reading a couple of emails and I just started to read a few more. And honestly, I, I, I cannot, I, I just, I was, I didn't know what to do. You know, I was sitting here and I was thinking, how can we help these parents? Forget about like, is one thing I've dedicated my whole life to trying to help the children and to uh, treat the children, right? And to teach everyone ABA and all that sort of stuff. And I, I just, sometimes it's not really about learning what to do as much as it is about just having someone that you can vent to and having someone that can just, you know, put their arms around you and say, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. You're going to make it through this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as you know, Shannon, I've always said the, the thing that pulled me into this field all the way back 1978 was the parents, was moms who would come into my office at UCLA and would sit down and would just tell me, just pour out their hearts. And I, that day, you know, the, at that time, I, I just realized there's no way I can walk away from it. How can I walk away from this and do anything else? And, and I felt the same draw yesterday when I was reading these emails. And I wanted to talk to you about it, which, you know, after the show, of course, we'll have some time. And, and just thinking, like, we need to do something just for the parents who are struggling. And there are so many parents where the mom or dad feels completely alone and just overwhelmed by the 
the tough side of autism, let's put it that way. And so I was very excited this morning to come in and help and answer some questions, but we'd lo I'd love to hear from some of the parents as well. You know, how can we help more when you're struggling? I love that. I do want to say that Missy has already written in and said, I loved Dr. Dor I love Dr. Doreen's TikTok and we well, love what you're you. doing over there because it's absolutely amazing. A lot of people are writing in. Let me say hi to some people to start. Hi to Michelle, Missy, of course, Aisha. Parker, Amanda, 619 Poker King, glad that you're here. Uh, Gareth is here with us. Chelsea is here with us. Sue is here with us. So thrilled that everybody is here this morning. I think I'm I, I think I'm gonna jump in when with Gareth Gareth's question, even though you said you were asking about parents, we're gonna get to parents, but Gareth had written in and said, I want to ask this question. Please can the group tell me, and my my chat just jumped. Uh, please can the group tell me after you have had a diagnosis, why have I been told by family, friends, and partners you're normal? You don't have autism. And he says that this is really hurting me. So maybe Dr. Grampy Shea, you, cause you've worked with a lot of families and seen this kind of thing. Maybe you can shed a little light. And then if others want to jump in, Gareth is uh, writing on Facebook. Um, if you're on Facebook and want to tell Gareth your thoughts on it, um, if you're watching at home, you can absolutely um, give him some support there as well. But Dr. Grampy Shea. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, I, I start by ha saying, you know, have you thought about why it's hurting you? Because really, it doesn't matter what other people think. It never should really matter to the point where it hurts you so much. Um, so I think the focus should be more on what is it about that that is hurting you? I mean, I have a lot of adults who I've seen who um, some do fit the criteria and it's a relief for them to know that they are part of a, a, a bigger group. It's a relief for them to know why certain things are difficult for them or have always been difficult for them. And then there are others who really don't fit the diagnostic criteria of autism, but uh, fit other diagnoses, for instance, uh, social anxiety disorder. Uh, or depression even, or a variety of other things. So what is it that is hurting you? If you believe that the diagnosis that you received was accurate, then that's all that matters. And, you know, let's go with that and, and uh, believe in that. A lot of lay people have a lot of opinions, but unless you have uh, you know, uh, training in diagnosis it doesn't really matter. And perhaps you can, if you feel that autism really is uh, the appropriate diagnosis for you, um, what I would do is try to educate those people about the various symptoms of autism that you feel you have. Um, and a lot of times people don't know enough about autism and they think, oh, it's got to be, uh, um, you know, one way or another. It has to be very severe or it has to be, you know, a per, you know, you have to have savant skills or people have all kinds of ideas about what autism is. Take those parts of the diagnosis that you feel really describe who you are and tell them. So, for example, uh, you know, with autism. Uh, it is really hard for a lot of people to take someone else's perspective. Maybe you can tell them that, that you struggle with that, or that you struggle with abstract communication, or that you struggle with whatever symptom of autism it is that, that you feel helps define you. But again, you know, my, my bigger words of advice, I guess, are don't care. Try to not care. Try to just, uh, everybody has to live their own lives, you know? And if we cared about everybody else's opinion, we'd be lost. <laughs> we'd never move forward. So, you know, that's that's really what I would suggest. I what love that. I, no, I, you know, I have, uh, somebody had said the phrase to me many years ago, other people's opinions of me is none of my business. Exactly. And and I, boy, I really took that on and, and, and then when I really truly had to learn it was when my son was diagnosed with autism 
And it's something that I say often, other people's opinions of my parenting is none of my business because I would care deeply. And, and, and when you start doing the math and draw it out on, on the chalkboard about, you know, is, is, does this person really understand what I'm going through? And so if the answer is no, then how would I allow their judgment of what I'm doing really matter to me? Yeah. It's hard. It's really yeah. hard. Um, because you have to separate yourself from it that way and realize that whatever they're thinking has more to do with them than it has to do with you. There was a, a dear friend of mine that just would not accept that my son had gotten a diagnosis of autism and would say to me all the time, no, he, what do you, you know, it, and then he would fill in the blank of why I, I was like, well, why have multiple doctors said this? And he would say things that were really upsetting, like, you just wanted attention. You just, you, like, <laughs> really. Yeah. And it didn't work for me. And I ignored it for a long time. And then I found myself wanting to be around him less and less, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Because and, I don't really want to yeah. hear that. Melissa, <laughs> not, not working. Melissa wrote in replying to Gareth and said, People don't see all of the things that you're struggling with inside, especially if you're good at masking. And that's a beautiful comment. Yeah. And you're absolutely right, Melissa. Nobody knows what we go through. Only we know. And, you know, hopefully you had a, yeah, a good diagnostician. And that's all you need, really. There we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, there's so many comments coming in. It's like, you know, pick, it's like Sophie's choice here. I want, I want to answer everybody's questions. I do have to start with something quick though, that somebody wrote in in the night and uh, they were on our website and said, is this information free? And I'm so happy to report that, yes, all the information that we provide here is free, which is really, uh, I'm very, very proud of. Uh, Missy wants to know, hi, Dr. Doreen, what services are out there when your child has graduated from ABA, is getting bigger, 12 years old, and still displays aggressive behaviors? How do we keep him and everyone else safe? I love that question, Missy, sending you a hug. Yeah, so many, so many ways a hug. And what a great question, Missy, because... You know, <clears throat> what you do, you can do two things. One is you can learn the different ways to manage the aggression. We could talk about it a little bit today. Or you can go back in and get ABA. I mean, let's, let's be very clear. ABA, you know, um, if, when you need help with a challenging behavior, ABA is the way to go. So it's not, ABA is not necessarily just for very young children who need a comprehensive kind of teaching program. ABA is for when you have aggressive behavior. That is a, a, an exact reason why you would need ABA. Because the way to, and, and you will get uh, insurance coverage for it no matter where you are, and you will get an intervention. It might not be comprehensive it might not be you know hundreds of hours over a long period of time but it will be an intervention that is very helpful and you will get board certified people coming into your house and teaching you how to manage the aggression now i will tell you some of the stuff about aggression and um and and how to manage it but it is difficult especially when your child is 12 and this is also one of the things that I was reading this weekend that kind of brought tears to my eyes was that a lot of parents deal with aggression and nobody knows. We don't talk about the aggression from our kids because we're kind of afraid to talk about it. We're afraid to jeopardize their futures or their placements. And we're afraid of people judging us and thinking this must be a bad parent who has an aggressive child, and it's none of those. It has absolutely nothing to do with that at all. All it is is that your child has learned that aggression is a functional form of communicating whatever it is he wants. You know, it's funny. Um, I don't know how many of you guys saw the Oscars the other day with, with Will Smith getting very upset and going over and hitting Chris Rock in the face, and that's aggression, right? That's assault. And somewhere, uh, you know, Will would have learned that a certain level of frustration is sufficient to justify aggression. And, uh, you know, in my life, in my society, in my environment, it's not. There is no level of frustration 
that justifies aggression, right? There's just no level of frustration that allows that. Our kids learn that if they are very frustrated, if they aggress, people will try to figure out what they want and will give it to them. Now, what they want is usually either I don't, they're trying to communicate, I don't want to do this, leave me alone or else I'm going to hit. Or they communicate, I want to go outside and no one's letting me go, I'm going to hit. Or I want an object or I just want your attention or it could be a variety of things. Like one of the things I was reading this weekend had to do with a parent where the child was, would just get frustrated about things in life, like it's snowing outside, so I can't go outside and play with the dog, and then would aggress, right? And so for the child, it has become a form of communication. I, I'm gonna say this, and this is super important, no challenging behavior, none. Aggression, tantrums, hitting, biting, kicking, spitting, running away, none of these are a symptom of autism, none of them. Nowhere have they ever been written as a symptom. When we diagnose, we do not look at those because they're not considered a symptom of autism. What they are is just a form of communication that the child has learned. Now, think about yourself. If you were trying to communicate with people and either you didn't understand their language or they didn't understand you, you'd get frustrated, right? And you would hit pinch, pull, whatever it is, you digress. And that's kind of a natural thing that happens. What we need to do is to teach our kids aggression doesn't work, language does work, or some sort of communication it could also be non-vocal communication. And that's really the difference. And the way we do that in ABA is that when the child, first of all, with aggression, you need to block it because people can get hurt, right? So as soon as the individual is about to aggress, he needs to be stopped physically and then given the words to ask for what it is that he wants. And that's where it becomes super important to have a professional because a BCBA will come in and identify what it is he's trying to communicate. And that's what we call the functional behavior assessment. So it's kind of like a, an aggressive act occurs. Sometimes it's really hard in the middle of that to figure out what was he trying to go? Why did he do that? Why? What was the why? And the why is what we call in behavioral language, the function. And there are ways that we figure out, oh, he did this because what he wanted was this, right? And, and you have to figure that out because if you don't know the function, if you don't know the reason for a behavior, you're not going to be able to change it successfully. It's not about punishing a behavior. It's about replacing the behavior with a more fun, adaptive form of communication that is easier, okay? Because aggressing is not easy. Like the person who's aggressing also wears themselves out. They like it, having a tantrum. It's very exhausting. So you need to figure out, okay, he's about to aggress for this reason. Before he aggresses, I'm going to have him just do an easy thing, like ask for it or ask for a timeout, or say, I want this object, whatever the reason is, right? Give him an easier way of asking for that so that his frustration dissipates and he doesn't get aggressive. Now, once it, you know, when you're dealing with a 12 year old or older and there's aggression involved, I will always recommend that you get a BCBA back in. And you can, you know, you all, that's all you need uh, is you have the diagnosis, you can certainly go in and ask your healthcare carrier for a short-term intervention that where they will send in a BCBA to give you advice and guidance like I just did. Amazing. Can I give a really short example of why you have to know what the function is? Because I think a lot of times we just don't get this. When my son was in third grade, there was a little boy in his classroom that at a certain time every day, this kid would get up run for the door and he would run out the door and across the field pretty yeah. much the same time every day. And I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to be impolite and say that there was a person on the staff who was not, not very, let's say she was ignorant to what we're talking about here. 
And yeah. so, and she was in charge. And so what she would do, the teacher would call and say, he's run again. She would send somebody out to get him, bring her to his, to her office. And then she would sit, have him sit. She had these beautiful club chairs in her office. She would put the child in this very comfy chair in That's her office. That's what right? he wanted. <laughs> and, and she would hand him a pencil and the two of them would sit there and, and the pencil would have a, an eraser on it and they would sit there and she would do it with him and they would bounce pencils on their erasers for 20 minutes. Oh, and, wow. and her theory was, we just have to make it so boring for him that he'll want to go back to the classroom. And I, every day I would come in to volunteer at a certain time and I would walk by and there the kid would happily be sitting in the club chair, bouncing the pencil yeah. with this person. And, yeah. and I, I would say to the teacher, how's that working for everybody? Cause it's yeah. working really well for him because she didn't think about what it was that that kid wanted. Yep. And what he wanted was a break and yep. she would give it to him, which meant that he would continue doing it every day. If she That's had right. stopped and considered that maybe we teach him how to ask a break and give him a break where we're teaching the lesson while he's doing something physical, that kid could have stayed in education and, and better use the resources. But she didn't really know what it was he wanted, assumed and then would do this thing and was un entrenched in her, um, you know, intervention too entrenched to see that it wasn't working. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. actually it's a really, really, really great point, Shannon. One of the thing, one of the ways that we figure out a function is to see what's not working, which is really interesting, right? When you see that, for instance, you know, he aggresses and you give him an object, but he still aggresses, you, you would ask yourself, maybe he's aggressing for some other reason. But if you give him an object and he calms down, then you know, oh, that's what he's trying to get, right? So aggression, so the, the things that don't work also give us a cue as to what it is the child is actually trying to communicate. And it's hard. It's not easy. But I so appreciate you saying that you need to work with an expert. I want to say too, we've talked about this a little bit before on the show, that when you are a parent who's getting hit, it is very easy to get upside down. And I suffered from yeah. something that I now talk about with parents and have heard from <laughs> parents. And it's very scary because all the things that Dr. Grand Pichet was saying, we start to hide it because we don't want people to judge us. We don't want them to judge our child. We don't want our child to be seen as a monster and lose out on opportunities or play dates or things like that. But then what ends up happening, honestly, is and I I, I heard it in my own brain and I hear it in other parents' brain, we start to say maybe I deserve it. And that is when you know that you are upside down. And I've, I, I said it myself and I've heard it from so many moms, especially that, that we, we justify it and say, cause it's like your brain has to come up with a way that it's yeah. not your child's yeah. fault. And so you yeah. say, I deserve it. I deserve yeah. to be hit because it must be something I'm doing wrong. Or you fill in the blank with what you think it is that you're doing wrong. That is upside oh, down yeah. thinking. Or you even, or you even, like a mom that I was reading yesterday had written, maybe it's karma. And, exactly. And it's something I did in the past. It, this has, the only relationship the hard part of autism has with you, I think, is that you are, you know, a strong enough soul that you've been given this, uh, this uh, task, I guess. You've been entrusted. Um, You've yeah, been entrusted yeah. with this journey, with this task, because, uh, you know, you can handle it. It has nothing to do with karma. And it has nothing to do with anything you have done. I've had so many parents come to me and say, you know, was it because when he or she was younger, I picked him up and shook him because I was angry? You know, like there's so many things that we go back to. And it just isn't, and it's not helpful, and, and you just need to kind of move forward and, and you know, just not blame yourself ever. For and if you're in that mode, if you're thinking that way at all, it's time to acknowledge it. I felt that way. I felt that way. I do not feel that way now. 
if you're feeling that way, it's time to get help. Uh, you need some support with that to help you to, to get to another place, a better place in the sun. All right, I'm going to move on to Sue. She says, hi, Dr. Doreen. My son attends center-based ABA. It's been a year he has started, but we still he still has got problems with stimming and a lack of independent play. I can't control his stimming. There is an obsession with fans. Yeah, well, we don't know how old this child is. Sue, if you're there, if you can tell us how old the child is. Yeah, and um, there's there there. I have just have so much to say to Sue here. I don't know how, how to contain it in, in a small moment of time. So um, you know, there's there's a and it would be helpful to know because if he if he is younger, then there's kind of a uh, there's a plan, you know, there's a, there's a curriculum and there's a series He's of things. Four. Through. He's four. Okay. Yeah. So, and that is in the younger category. That means that he should be going through a series of lessons. I'm going to talk about that in a, right now. Uh, it, it doesn't jump around like this. It's not kind of like, oh, we're dealing with his stimming and his independent play. That's kind of not how it goes. So let me talk about how an overall program works. So self-stimulatory behavior, and in his case, it sounds like it's an obsession with fans. So we would classify this as a visual self-stimulatory behavior. And let me just start out by saying we know very little about visual, about any kind of self-stimulatory behavior. In the behavioral world, uh, the you know people believe that it is somehow stimulatory, somehow intrinsically rewarding to uh, look at circular things like fans, uh, or to line your objects up, or to do this. You know that's a visual self-stimulatory type of behavior as well. Um, in the medical field, it is more believed that these self-stimulatory behaviors are calming in some way or another, and it could very well be. We don't know about what the need is for these visual self-stimulatory behaviors. I think in terms of visual stuff, I learned the most from Temple Grandin, who talks about the fact that it is very difficult to see things in a three-dimensional uh, kind of uh, way, so you tend to look at them in different ways, and that gives you more like pictures of things that are happening in your environment. Who knows? Who, who knows at this point what stimulation the child is getting out of looking at fans? We really just don't know enough. The way that we deal with it behaviorally is that we try to block it and replace it with uh, you know, eye contact and various other forms of appropriate eye activity. Now, I would also suggest, uh, still as a behaviorist, I will tell you that there's this thing called the pre-MAC principle, which allows you to use behaviors that are very, uh, I guess, satisfying or high uh, rate, high rate behaviors. So a behavior that occurs very frequently to use it as a reward. Uh, for other behaviors that are not occurring as, as high rate. So for instance, in, in your child's case, they should be uh, on a schedule allowing him to look at a fan for a couple of minutes as a reward for having done something else. And that something else could be anything. It could be, um, you know, vocalizing that he wants to look at a fan. It could be learning his lessons. It could be having a social conversation with another person. It depends on your child's actual abilities and where they are in the overall program. But a lesson, uh, and then you can reward it with a minute of looking at a fan. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. That is a completely doable thing. Now, moving on to the concept of independent play, independent play is a very, very advanced uh, uh, play uh, modality. And I'm not sure your child at four is quite there yet. It depends on how much therapy he's already had. Um, and, you know, if he's four years old and he started when he was, let's say, three, and just looking at the spelling, it looks like you're in either London, New Zealand, Australia, you're in a English, British 
uh, type of country. So I don't know really if you're getting intensive ABA. If you if your son has received intensive ABA, um, or even should be, I mean, should be at the age of four, right? Then you have a full program, and the full program works on all of the following areas: language, social skills, play skills, as you mentioned, motor skills, adaptive skills, um, and let's see what else. Maybe early phases of cognitive skills. Um, and so there's a lot of different areas at four. And we tackle a little bit of each one. Personally, at four, my focus would be on the language curriculum. And it would be a lot of trying to teach the child abstract ways of communicating. I'd also be working on play, but most likely I'd be teaching uh, play skills as opposed to independent play. So for instance, I'd be teaching the child things like constructive play, building things if he's four years old, playing appropriately with pretend play, putting little toys inside cars, et cetera, and pretending various things. There's, there's earlier aspects of play that normally develop at two and three, and I don't know if your child has done those, but we try to fill in the gaps you don't jump and teach something that's like a four-year or five-year skill. You teach all the two-year, three-year, everything before that because you want the child to kind of catch up and not be lacking in any area. So that's what I would, I would go back to your center and I'd say, hey, like, what are we doing for the self-stimulatory activity and what are we doing for the play activity? All that said... There is a particular game uh, or dr lesson that we call uh, PlayStations that is for independent play. So we set up stations and each station, for instance, could be like station one. These are activities that usually have their own completion, like a puzzle or a, you know, um, I don't know, something where you have to put the blocks on top of each other to complete it or various types of stations and of different toys. And, and I would start out very small. I would start out with one, and then I would make it two stations and so on. And uh, the, basically the child is taught to go to station one. There's a paper you put like, or some sign there that says, okay, like if it depends on the child's abilities again, some children can visually read, other children uh, can't read at all or can't recognize icons. In which case, all you really do is you teach the child to, let's say, turn over an egg timer or set a timer. And it's for, uh, you know, 10 seconds or 30 seconds, something very small and manageable. And the child will play with that. And then the parents will come and reward them. And then gradually you make it two stations. Now the child will play with this for 30 seconds or a minute. We'll go over to the other place and play, play with the second object for a minute. Then the parents will come and reward them. And so you do this and you increase the time in each station and you increase the stations so that eventually your child can actually keep themselves engaged for, let's say, 15 to 20 minutes rotating because we don't want kids doing the same activity for half an hour. Um, and so that's how you teach independent play. But it is very important before you do that for the child to have the capability of playing at each station. So they need to know a lot of different types of just play and, you know, building blocks and like activities with toys and that sort of thing. Long, long answer. You're on mute. Sorry, there's so many more things that we could say too. I just want to say, Sue, I loved everything that Dr. Grampy Shea said. And I just want to hug you because I remember when my son was four and I really wanted him to be showing evidence that everything was coming together. And I was very impatient for that. And I just want to tell you that when my son was four, he was still engaged in a lot of stimming and vocal stereotypy, and he was still was not able to play on his own. And I, I just want to put it into your backpack that at least evidence of one um, individual that my son is 18 years old and almost never 
in, I engage in more vocal stereotypy than he does. Let's say that, right? And he completely can go and entertain himself for hours on end. So I, I want to tell you that at four, that was my worry too. And you know, we're we're totally fine there. Everybody's different. Um, but I love that you wrote in and said to Dr. Grampiche that you're doing 34 hours a week of ABA. Very I think, good. I think that's amazing. And very, kudos very to you because that's really hard right now to do. But I think that's the single best thing um, that you've got going for you is is that you're 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 all in and obviously you're a good parent. So um Amanda has written in and said that she's thinking about doing a respite exchange program for single parents because it is so hard when you can't get or qualify for respite. And she says, I have three special needs kids um, and a new, new to the state of Texas with zero help. And Amanda, I just want to say that um, in Colorado, they, they, they've been doing a program where it's Medicaid buy-in, where you can buy in for a very low amount and have your children get crazy good coverage. And Texas has been teetering on this for a um, and saying that they might go for it. And if you want some help to try and apply, I can't guarantee you that it's going to work. You'd be a test case, but I think you'd be a good test case. So if you're at all interested in that, reach out to me. Um, here's think it's what? also a really good idea. I think what Amanda is saying, I mean, and also oh. I, I, had, I had another parent reach out. I'm talking to them, I think next week, and they've developed a software for setting up play dates with other kids who are, and we've always talked about this, right, Shannon, for years and years. But I think it's, you know, this is also a pretty good idea is like um, getting, having access to other parents and saying to those parents, hey, can we like help each other out? Trade. So that, yeah, trade. And also, I mean, you know, of course, that's one thing. The other thing is that just having that support system around you, I think is extremely helpful. And being part of that community that understands what you're going through, I think it's really important. Absolutely. Kirsten says, I have a question concerning couples on the spectrum. If one individual recognizes that they're on the spectrum and is figuring out their own triggers and quirks, but the mm -hmm. other individual does not acknowledge this, um, this is, uh, excuse me, my thing is jumping around, this sudden re re realization and continues to treat and converse with the other individual as if there is no processing issue when it comes to emotions. Um, things like tone, not hearing exactly what the other person is saying or internalizing. Um, she goes on to describe many different symptoms of things that are happening, that there's imposter syndrome or the individual going catatonic during high pressure debates, that it's becoming a severe issue. What kind of advice do you have? Because we hear this a lot, that one person has the revelation, oh, part of the reason why I'm having problems in the relationship is that I've got these other things. They start seeking a diagnosis, but the other partner goes, no. <laughs> and, just, yeah. and, and, and they just revert back to how things were. It can become very difficult. What, what do you recommend? Yeah. So it's so funny though, um, Amanda, that you said this because, you know, if you this think one about is Kirsten, it, this one is oh, Kirsten. Sorry, Kirsten. Yeah. And, and by the way, um, Trayvon, I just lost my entire chat. So not sure what I can do about that, but, um, <laughs> When when that happens, it's funny because when I was first hearing you say that, Shannon, I was like, okay, I mean, this pretty much happens in almost all relationships, right? So, and it's wonderful that at least, you know, if both couples are on the spectrum here and one has recognized that this has to do with the autism that we both have, right? Because in other relationships, nobody can figure out there's always one person that is like more uh, aware and open and listening to the other. And the other partner is like, what did I do? Like, what's going on here? I don't really know what I did wrong or what's going on. So what you're explaining here, Kirsten, is a very common thing in relationships. It isn't just about autism. It's about relationships. And when we have relationships, it becomes super important to explain to the other person those things they don't see. And it's sometimes hard. We get frustrated because why can't they see this? I don't understand. This person has been my partner for 10 years. Why don't they know this is what I need? They don't. It's just that simple. And 
before you get frustrated, it becomes super important to sit them down and just say, hey, this is difficult for me. You do not understand that this causes me anxiety. I need you to please understand. And this is my cue. When I'm about to do this, it's because I feel anxious. When, you know, this type of tone scares me or whatever it is, you've gotten really, really close to identifying those things. And that is huge because like I'm telling you, most neurotypical couples don't recognize those things as being the issue. So what you've done is you started to identify the issues is fabulous. Just tell the other person, these are my triggers. These are the things that cause me to have issues and I would really like you to pay attention to them. That's all. That's all it is. And, and you know, Shannon, I'm sure you do. I do. I, I get, I for no reason at all, I get upset with my spouse because he can't read my mind, you know, or because he doesn't really, he's not fantastic at reading my cues. So it, it just, that's, that's kind of my take on it. And, and can I just say that one of the things that I've learned, uh, cause we're going to be married 20 years this summer. Wow. Uh, what, one of the things that I've learned is that when you're having a conversation, sometimes there's so many things going on. The person is trying to listen, but they're also thinking about how to respond. So my husband knows that if I write him a letter, that is me saying, you better pay attention. <laughs> This is, yeah. this is so I write the letter and the nice thing about the letter is I get to think about what I want to say. I don't have to deal with his response. Um he doesn't have to be thinking about what he's My internet just went. Yep, you're back. I'm back. Okay. So I put it I I write him a letter, I put it on the pillow and I maybe it takes me 20 tries, but I write the letter and I say here's what's really important to me. Here's, awesome. here's how this makes me feel. Here's what I need from you to acknowledge this and tell me that how, how we're going to work on it or whatever. That's what I do. A letter. Yeah. And yeah. over the years, he's learned if I'm talking about something, I'm a little irked about it. But if I write a letter, it's serious business time. Um, so there you go. Uh, Shalish wants to know, hi, Do hi, Doreen. My son is four years old. He has phases of six to seven uncontrollable laughter episodes every day. They asked, is it sugar or something else? I asked them uh, earlier, I said, talk about the diet a little bit, how much sugar, how many carbs. And her response was that they took sugar out of his diet about a year ago because they saw a correlation with sugar, although they're not sure that he's not getting sugary snacks at school. Um, and I asked about carbs and she says, um, not, uh, he says he eats, she says he eats fruits like oranges, strawberries, but less carbs, question mark. So yeah. there we are. We're going to start to talk about diet. You know what, what that's going to be like. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try to contain it too. <laughs> my biggest, uh, my big, my initial reaction as soon as I hear uncontrollable laughter is not sugar, it's yeast. That's my first go-to um, because I've seen that, because I've seen it actually. And um, so yeast, of course, you know, the whole, I'm not going to talk for an hour about the fact that a lot of our kids struggle with yeast, but this has to do with early, usually it has to do with early uh, uh, exposure to antibiotics or it could be a variety of other things, but our children lose the healthy gut bacteria that prevents them from growing yeast, and therefore they start to experience candida. Um, and candidiasis or candida um, can have a lot of different kinds of effects on behavior. Uh, so one of the things is that well, there's two sides to it. What it one is Sometimes when your child has high levels of yeast, and this can be texted for, but uh, sometimes when that happens, uh, your child will seem very kind of zoned out or tuned out, not involved, not able to engage, not able to pay attention. And what's even more important and interesting is that when you, if you connect with a physician 
and the physician gives you antifungal medications for the yeast, and there's a variety of them, uh, Nizoral, Diflucan, etc. These are, um, you know, medication that the child takes orally. And when you do that, there's this phase that we call yeast die-off, and that is a lot of giggling for no reason. So, and it doesn't have to necessarily be even medication. Sometimes the gut is forming its own bacteria and there's a yeast die-off reaction. So you, I would really, really go see a physician and say, I think my child has yeast. I think it's a candida. Can you do testing, blood tests to determine whether or not that is correct and can we treat it? And then you have to be very patient because the treatment takes a little bit of time. Yeast is difficult. And, um, you know, you have to go dietary as well as medication in order to kind of eliminate it because a lot of dietary, a lot of things in our diet feed yeast. So anything with gluten is going to increase yeast because that's the way it is. You leave bread out, it will form fungus very quickly. Um, anything with sugar will feed yeast. And so there are specific diets that will help you reduce the yeast faster. But that's kind of where I turn to. That's my first go-to or rule out. Kind of I want to deal with make sure there's no yeast issues. Then I can look at other aspects of the diet. There you go. I love that. Uh, Ron Dunia has asked a question and they, they addressed it to me, but I think it's, I, I think we should let you have your first crack at it. And then of course I I always have an opinion. Uh, but they said, hi, Shannon, what do you think is more helpful, ABA or Sunrise? And they qualified that and said, especially to deal with an aggressive child. So you go first, Dr. Grand Pichet. Okay. So, I mean, my simple answer to that is ABA is going to be more effective. And I'm not even, I'm not there's no question in my mind. I'm not saying that as a board certified behavior analyst or as someone who has like done 40 years of ABA. ABA is going to be more effective because the Sunrise program is not one that will intrude upon and try to uh, um, assertively change behavior. Uh, you know, ABA is. The Sunrise program is much more. Uh, allows the child to have their own kind of interactions with society. Uh, ABA will not allow aggression and will replace it with some other form of better communication. So, so I would highly recommend that. And my two cents, because you asked for it, um, my college roommate... Uh, she got married much younger than I did and had two sons and her second son was diagnosed on the spectrum and had some pretty intense challenges. And at that time, ABA was not available everywhere. And she looked at what could she possibly do? She found the sunrise program. I have never seen a person work harder than she did. She went and paid so much money to get trained for herself, to get her family trained. She arranged volunteers in her community to come and be on a schedule to work with her child. She trained all of them. She was amazing. And I looked at that and I thought I could never do that. I could never do what she did. And her son is a beautiful human being who is in his late twenties now who, uh, you know, still has amazing challenges, will never live independently. Um, and, and she tells me, I, I think that he is an amazing human being, but she comes and sees my child and she puts her head down on the table and she weeps and says, if I had had what you had had, where would my child be? And, and, and that breaks my heart every single time. This is the only experience I have with Sunrise. Um, personally, you know, because I've seen her and, and look, you know, I mean, she loved it and, but where her son is and what she sees, and she's been in my home many times to see the ABA and see what happened with Jem. And she says, this is amazing. If I had it to do over again, I wish I could do what you did. And, and to me, hero, she went that for her kid, but she, that's, if she were here, she would tell you to run towards the ABA. I know that. So that's my two cents on that. Aren't you sorry you asked? <laughs> so 
I, I want to get to a question um, that was a, a lot of times we've had these questions come in from siblings. Do we have enough time? We do. Okay. <clears throat> in the night, a sibling wrote in who's 19 years old. She's a female. She had, and she says, apologies. There's a little TMI here, but her twin brother is on the spectrum and he's nonverbal. She's recently moved back home to help her mother because things have gotten a little bit bad. He was fully potty trained. And then at 16, uh, he's, and he's 19 now. So I'm thinking somewhere right around the start of the pandemic actually is the timeline. Um, he began, uh, pooping in different places around the house. She says, uh, you know, what you need to know is that he used to love the sound of flushing and the coldness of the toilet seat. So, um, he would often go in and sit on the toilet seat fully clothed because he enjoyed it so much. And he would sit there and play his games, but he started pooping on the floor, uh, in the bathroom instead of the toilet. And initially they thought it was because he was constipated and struggling to go to the bathroom instead of the, instead of the toilet. Um, but now it's, it's taken on a whole new thing and he is now pooping in different places of the house. And now it has gone to peeing in different levels uh, of the house. It's, uh, he's also stopped wiping himself, um, and that any attempt to, you know, propel him towards the toilet is met with a complete and total meltdown, even to the, the extent of self-harming. So, um, you know, she said recently her mother had friends over and they thought that they had it under control and that he was in his room. We lost you there, Shannon, for a minute. Uh, what are I? Oh, sorry, Shannon. We lost you for a minute. That they thought he was under control and he was in his room. And what happened? He slipped down to the kitchen and left a present on the kitchen floor that was found by one of the guests. And right. and she said, "Please, any help would be greatly appreciated." Yeah, this is so hard. This is one of the reasons that I really just encourage parents to do as much as they possibly can when the children are younger and smaller, because it is so, so, so difficult to change behavior when someone is 19 and when a behavior becomes kind of embedded, you know, and it becomes a habit. So I really in this kind of a severe situation, I would recommend getting a BCBA. You should be help. your health insurance will cover that. You really should be getting help from a board certified behavior analyst who can come into the house and set up a behavior intervention plan for this particular thing. This is a very, very big deal. And it can, you know, make life a lot easier, a lot harder, depending on how it goes. Um, I, if, if he still likes the flushing and the cold toilet, that's great because those things could be used as reinforcers. There are a lot of other ways that you can also make the toilet his favorite place to go because right now it sounds like you can't usher him in there. But you could put a TV in there, you could put a computer in there, and only in there. In other words, it, he shouldn't have access to those items outside of the toilet. Make the toilet the most attractive place for now. Um, he clearly is getting attention from voiding in places where he is not allowed to void, right? So somebody comes over, I am not, I don't know. This is why you need a BCBA there. I don't know exactly how it's dealt with, but I assume someone gets mad at him, uh, maybe raises their voice. Uh, and then cleans the thing up. I don't know, but this, you know, it, it is definitely something where he is now getting the attention of maybe your mom or whoever it is. And this is just one way that he has control over getting her attention. Um, it could get worse, believe it or not, because he could start s smearing the feces over the walls and such, but, but that becomes something that sometimes uh, our adults also enjoy doing from a sensory perspective. But um, get a behaviorist, it is not a major deal. It's not the hardest thing. It's, in fact, it can be quite pleasant and they can teach him that you only, it's kind of like a shorter version of the training, but it's a retraining 
which makes it clear to him that there will be lots of rewards if you void in the toilet. And also, there's this thing in ABA we don't often talk about, but it is a process of overcorrection. Well, he is the one that cleans the mess if he makes a mess. So there's a difference where he has to go and clean the, the uh, you know, what he has voided on the kitchen floor or anywhere else in the house. Um, but when he goes to the toilet and goes on the toilet, he gets a massive amount of reward. For instance, he gets to play half an hour on the computer that remains in the toilet. So in other words, rewards that are not otherwise available and are meaningful to him are attached to going and voiding in the toilet itself. And then uh, the other stuff is actually just not the, you know, don't talk about it, don't yell at him, anything like that, just model through so that he needs to clean it up and then you move on. But it's very, very hard. And I really, there could be a million other things going on. I am not there, so I can't see exactly what function is maintaining this behavior. Shannon had a good point. It's also kind of coincides with COVID. So it's possible that, you know, sometimes our kids have no other way of expressing their anxieties and frustrations and such. And so they start doing these types of challenging behaviors. I really do recommend that you get a BCBA in there, which all you have to do is call your health insurance and ask for a behavior analyst to come in and do a functional behavior assessment so you know exactly what to do. Wonderful. Yeah, I've heard you and other experts talk before about when potty training is very solid and there is a sudden change that you really got to look at what, what else changed and that sometimes there's some sort of trauma. And, and I think we need to be careful about like, you know, trauma could be, you had a nightmare and, and now it's bothering you, but something changed. Yeah. Uh, Constipation could be the trauma. Yeah. I mean, some, some, yeah, something changed. Yeah. And, and that it's kind of important to be looking at that too, because that's going to inform how you do things really quickly. And I wrote something back, but, um, you know, a couple of people have written in and said, now they're interested in ABA, but is there an age that's too late? Someone said is six years old too late. Um, I I said, no, it's just different. It's just different when you start at six than three, because you're going to start in different places and work on different things, but it's not too late. Olympic athletes use ABA. Yeah. Um, so right. it's a teaching method and, and so not too late. We're out of time. I don't even know how that happens, Dr. Grant Boucher, but you've been answering questions on Ask Dr. Doreen that we don't, uh, on TikTok that we don't get to. So if any of you are interested and you want more, head on over to Ask Dr. Doreen on TikTok. We're, are, are we having you next week live, Dr. Grant Boucher? It's the first week in April. Between now and then, we're, we're going to start moving into our new studio, and we're very excited about that. But I just want to say that someone may or may not be having a birthday coming up very soon um, mm-hmm. in the very beginning of April. So if anybody, uh, you guys have a week, if you want to send in uh, birthday messages for Dr. Grand yeah, so I, yeah. I would be happy to ferry them to her. If any of you wish to wish her a happy birthday, we would be happy to devote some time to that. I'm mm-hmm. sorry that we didn't get to all the questions, but uh, make sure that you're here with us tomorrow. We've got an amazing we were talking about helping parents. We've got an amazing coach for parents to help them to deal with some of the feelings that's going to be with us tomorrow. So that should be very interesting. Nice. Uh, and then on Thursday with Nancy Allspot Jackson for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, we have an autism dad. We don't have enough of those, right? Who's written a new okay. book um, at talking about what that is like called Apollo autism. So I can't wait to learn more about that. So all of that coming up, but we're done for today. So until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too as well. Bye-bye for now. Bye everyone. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. 
And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.